Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Compassion is the catalyst for the manifestation of the power of God. Let's go on. Luke 15, verse 20. Prodigal son. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. I think you, you, you're starting to get the picture. The, the New Testament is very deliberate in its portrayal of compassion. It has to do with the eye gate. It's not about our sensitivity in, in terms of feeling. We see with, with the injured man in the previous scenario. A lot of people passing by would have sympathy. A lot of people passing by may have empathy. They'd be able to feel it because they were there. They were mugged too. They were hijacked too. But that gives them more reason to go on by because they understand the dangers too. And yet there's a, there's a particular way of looking, viewing things, which is very interesting because if we get that right, we begin to experience God's manifest accompaniment. God is with us to do what his heart wanted to do all along. So when Christ comes along and he, he sees a situation the way God does, God pitches and then amazing miracles happen. I wish I can say this every week, but people, we must not be seduced into running after miracles and pursuing miracles and wanting to do miracles and signs and wonders. It's not of God. Our challenge is to see what God sees so we can feel what he feels so we can do nothing except have a conversation with him about what he wants done in a particular situation. This morning we're talking about Jude 122. On some have compassion, making a distinction. We're talking about a certain emotional intelligence that comes from the heart of the Father, that comes from the mind of the Father. There's so much misdirected compassion in this world, and well-meaning people are doing a lot more harm to this world than evil people. I know some of you don't agree with me, but I really feel strongly about that. I sometimes think if you can, you can just arrest a couple of those do-gooders in the middle of chaos, we'll, we'll have half the, the world's problem solved. Some people just don't have the ability to stand back and to think through the issue, and some people are so committed to doing good, but they don't have a moral center. They don't have any sense of morality at all, but they have all these pressing feelings. They want to make a difference, and it has nothing to do with the recipients of their goodness. It has anything to do with the selfish need for a sense of significance. That's why so much harm gets done. And a lot of organizations share it corporately. A lot of groups share this on the whole. Romans 5, verse 5 reads, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. In the NET, it reads like this, The love that comes from God and that produces our love for God has been poured out within our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So biblical compassion has a lot to do with whether we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit or not. Now, it sounds like something one shouldn't say in church, but unfortunately it's something one, one should say to charismatic people all along. For, for some reason, we, we do love sometimes and, and we have conversation about love, but mostly we've got a conversation about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is all about helping us to do life. And the Holy Spirit hasn't come, as, come to make us do stuff. The Holy Spirit's job has come to help us make us be, be like God. 
And God isn't the great I do. God is the great I am. You know, one of the hardest things for us as believers is to go through those moments or come to moments when God says to you, do nothing. Just watch. I want him to talk to you. Just, just, just stand still for a little bit. And I go home and pray about it and come back, watch some more. There's some stuff I, I need for you to learn. But the power to slow down, I cannot tell you how important that is when it comes to a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Of all the mistakes I've made in ministry over, over the years is because of a lack of meekness. You're in a situation and exciting things are happening and, and, and you're really sensing God and you know God is moving and we get so excited. I've seen people's lives ruined through my good efforts in ministry and I don't say that proudly. When I stand before God and I say this in PM terms, and I've got a lot of, lot of issues he's going to talk to me about because you see, that's, that's with us as believers. The stewardship that we have of the image of God, of, of the, the power of God, is, it's, it's a lot greater than we realize. The Father takes it so seriously. Life is not a game, and, and following Christ is not a game. It's not a sport, and it's not entertainment. We don't do it for leisure. It's eternal. And so many times we, we take what happens down here again way too seriously because we live like the pagans we live like this is all we have this this life we've got one shot we don't have one shot we've got one shot to prepare us for the real life which happens in eternity and it's quite sad to see how the increasing pressure of the world is is making christians more desperate than the people outside the church desperate to get everything in this life and to do everything in this life and to be everything in this life And this life is so short for a, for a reason. We serve an eternal God, and we are finite beings blessed with an extraordinary little, little time of earthly existence. And what makes that existence so critical and so important is because it's all that God has given us to prepare for the fulfillment of our actual purpose that happens in the age to come. Can somebody say amen? Now, to say stuff like that is so weird to modern people because we don't go there in our minds. You can go to a lot of church in the, the, the area now and, and you can hear a prosperity message that is not the gospel. And it's so sad, it's such a travesty of the truth because it has to do with the presupposition that this is it. There's no eternal hope. And so this is where we find our feet. This is where we begin to get anchored. And this is what the Holy Spirit has come to help us with. It's to understand something of the love of God, of compassion. And the most important thing I need to say about this right now is that you and I don't have it. And you and I are not capable of it. So in dealing with this issue, the most important thing is to go to God on a regular basis. Daily if you can. And say, God, I can't, but I so want to. Spirit of God, continue the pouring, not the power, not the magic. I want the image of the Father. Pour the love of the Father into me. Okay, now, now, now it's, it's, it's going to get... Um, little bit more challenging. Go with me to Mark 8, 22 to 25. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he'd spit in the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and then the man's eyes opened, and, and, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. You see, it, it's such a powerful, powerful, powerful picture here. Of 
of our relationship with God through Christ. Think of it like this. There's a, uh, a preacher in the village. And he's got his tent and his megaphone or whatever, and, and, and he's preaching. So there's an altar call, and, and a spiritually blind guy comes in, and he gets introduced to Christ. And then Christ has a conversation with him and says, what do you see? And he says, well, uh, I'm, so, I'm so blessed, I, I can see, I can see. But watch this. Christ meets the man in the village, and he takes him by the hand and takes him for a walk. And it's at that, from that moment on, that man can sing, I know Jesus because he's holding my hand. I know Jesus because we're walking a road. I know Jesus, when, when I was a kid, um, they used to sing this hymn, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. This man must probably be the author of that song. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own, and he comforts me. He's my shepherd. I'm being shepherded by Christ. But watch this. Nothing has happened yet. Christ has just taken him by the hand and walked him. But watch this. Christ doesn't do anything for the man while they're in the village. Christ walks him outside of the village. Now, for me, this is one of the challenging aspects of, of getting to know God, getting to know Christ, getting to know compassion, because sometimes the miracles cannot happen, like with Abraham, where you live in a metaphorical sense. It cannot happen in the space that you occupy. The first thing Christ many times does with us is He takes you by the hand and He walks you out of your current space. And it's so sad to see so many people who have a relationship with Christ, but they still are on their way outside to where Christ wants to heal them. He wants to touch their eyes. But He's not going to do it in your black village, in your white village, in your rich village, in your poor village, in your male village, in your female village. He's not going to do it in your marginal village or your privileged village. He's not going to do it there. Christ has a need to walk you out of your village. And once you come outside of your village, then he says, I need to do something for you right now. He puts clay on the man's eyes, and he says to the man, do you see? And the man says, yeah, but I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 can, I can see a, a lot of people, and there's a lot of movement. It's very exciting, but, but, but people look like stuff. They look like trees. At the moment in our world, there are a lot of people like that out there, and they're in the body of Jesus Christ. And we've got a huge crisis in the world. And the crisis in the world today is about, it's, it's a big phrase, but I want you to remember it, identificational politics. Can you say that? Identificational politics. It's the politics of identity, the who am I? who are you and who am I to you and who are you to me Christ called his disciples to him once and said listen um, there's a lot of conversation happening in the nation I, I know it's about me um, it's about who I am and, and what's the word in the streets what, what, what do the people say who am I and eventually he says to the disciples but who do you say who, who am I what, what do you say about my identity once Christ gets an uh, answer from Peter that is satisfactory, he begins to speak into Peter's identity. He says, you are Peter. In fact, I'm giving you a new name right now. I'm giving you a new identity right now. And he speaks, begins to speak prophetically into Peter's future. For the next few minutes, I, I just want to speak about where the world is at right now and why the world is, is out here. I said last week, like, with, with Brexit, with England leaving the, the UK, it's a God moment. It's a huge moment because it shouldn't be happening. It's, 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 it's like um, a soccer team or rugby team that loses. It's, it's losing 
statistically, losing the game and then there's this fluke of a goal or a fluke of a try that, that swings everything. It's, it's one of those moments historically. For the next while, God, I believe, is about to pull up the handbrake of the world's history to give us a little window in which we have opportunity to get the work done, the work of the Father done. If the handbrake does not get pulled up, the world would have been, the West would have been under martial law in less than three years. I know a lot of you don't look around. I do it all the time as well. I pray into these things. Europe and America is that close to having martial law imposed on us. Everything that's happening is happening by design. But in the middle of all of that, the chaos, the political upheaval has one thing in common. Identity, politics, the who am I and who am I not. And the fact that I can choose and decide to be what I am and who I am at any given time and I can change my mind every three days. And it's a Genesis chapter 1 situation. God said, I create you humans in my image. And Satan said, no, I will remake that. And he says to Christ, by the time you come back, the whole of the world will look like me, they'll act like me, and they will think like me. And so Christ says in Matthew 25, when I come back home and I have the nations before me, I'm, I'm looking for one thing. I'm, I'm wanting to see who's got the nature of the lamb, who are sheep nations, and who are goat nations, who's got the nature of of the evil one. I don't know if, if you're aware of it, but if you're a Freemason or if you're a Satanist, you're aware of the goat head, Baphomet, the god Baphomet, one of the images of Satan. And Christ was using all of this imagery very deliberately. He wasn't speaking about how religious th the world would be. He was talking about identity politics. And if believers don't understand this right now, we're going to miss God because God is about to move very powerfully now. I believe God is about to reveal His power. I believe God is about to, to manifest His glory mightily in, in seeing restoration in people's lives in this area in a way we've never seen before. But we need to understand what God is doing and what, what is going on. It's a lot more important to hear what God says about who we are, to hear what God says about what's going on, in one sense. We must understand what the politics are about. Can, can we just put that graphic up there quickly? The black was white and the white was black, but he still held a racial prejudice against people. Now, th this, is, this is heavy, people, because Scripture says you must discriminate. That's our first Scripture. It says, make a distinction. To discriminate means to make a distinction. And at the same time, it's wrong to make a distinction. And it's very important for us as believers to understand something about this.